Hello everybody, welcome to another live stream and thank you for joining. And um, before we start, I do have to thank my moderators, Digger, Timber and Norm for all the hard work that they do. I really do appreciate them. And if I miss something in chat, I know they'll be there to catch it. I've moved back to my iPhone camera, hence looking a bit brighter and a different angle because I was having a lot of problems with my lips syncing with the sound. So can I just ask you in the chat to check that it's all right? 
and everything looks okay on your end. And yeah, just let me know if it's all working this time because when I went to put my previous live stream up on the YouTube sort of live bit, it was awfully out of sync. Now I'm really small for most of it, thankfully, but it's still annoying, isn't it? So let's hope this is better. It does mean my iPhone's up there, it's plugged in, I hope everything's working and it's all right until Google wanted verification just before I started and I had to unplug it all and you know, sign up. So let's just see if chat says it's all okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, no one's, oh, it looks fine here. That's good. Oh, what a relief. You know, these things are just, I mean, I tried and tried and tried to get it in sync, but testing it yourself, I must have done so many private live streams. And in the end, I just gave up and went to the iPhone and whatever you say about them, they work. What can I say? So on to the matter at hand, Port de Norwich. I'm going to confess, I didn't get as far as I wanted. It's a long time since I laid track and that wasn't the problem. It just, it took me a long time to build the baseboards and it was all very exciting to go back to laying track, to building baseboards, but I got rid of all my wood power tools a long time ago. I actually had to buy a, I think I got a fret saw so I could cut out some wood on the side for holes you'll see in a bit. And then everyone was like, oh, you need to adapt your points. I was like, I actually need to cut the track. I had to go and buy a piercing saw, both of which are really valuable hand tools. And I finally worked out how to get them to work, but it's been a bit of a learning curve. Pico have introduced a unifrog since I last laid track. You know what? I've just got, I mean, I've laid so many. Bear in mind, I've done three layouts, one UK and two US already. Plus this one was completely hand laid previously. So it's not that I haven't done track, I felt really rusty. But more of that than that in a minute. Let's go look what's in the chat. So, Paul's watching whilst down the pub. I don't know how you can hear me down the pub. They're always so noisy. Norm thinks it's filling up. That's a good one. Yeah, we're at 59 concurrent viewers and 125 views. I'm never quite sure what that means. Um, hi to everybody. So welcome to everybody in the chat. Nice to have you with me. Oh, good to hear it's nice audio and video. So I'm really, really happy with that this time. So we'll just go back to the iPhone. Muddy Marvellous says it's slightly out of sync, but okay. It was like almost a second out on the last one. And it didn't, it doesn't look it, when I look at the screen, which is over there, which is why I'm looking that way, it looks in sync and you can't tell at this end. It just, it's weird. At least I can't tell. So, loads of people. I'm not going to do individual names because I just don't want to offend anyone by missing one person out. But there we go. So, live stream, track. This week it's all about, actually it's baseboards first and then track. I've never, I've never done a movable layout until I started Port de Norwich. I've always done them, actually that's not, that's not true. And this is my sixth or seventh layout I've done when I think about it. So I've done two large New Haven layouts, which got ripped, first one got ripped out, second one went in. I did a UK layout that was on legs down the side of my first lounge. And then I did an ON30 modular that was slightly rippling and curved. That was, that's if I do them high, you can see that. Um, that was really exciting. And then I did this, the last version, which didn't work. And in all those times, I've never bought baseboards before. I've made them out of all sorts of stuff, mostly plywood, foam, bits of wood cobbled together, depending how much it had to be moved. So this has been a dream. I have done laser cut baseboards. Not cheap, but then wood's not cheap at the moment. But wow, what a difference. You can't do them bespoke. So my old Port de Nord layout, the first iteration, was beautifully curved, very nice, very interesting. This one, very square but whew, I have enjoyed the process. So what have we got here? So we're doing well in Florida, that's good. Oh, Cars and People says, love my Star Wars build, greetings to the Netherlands. Greetings to the Netherlands, and yeah, they're fun. I've just agreed to do a collab 
um, yesterday with um, James, who is Rebel Base Build, and he's designing a Scorpion droid. And he's going to do the droid. I'm going to do the... Um, oh, I forgot to bring Mando around. I bought a six scale... No, a 12 scale Mando Black Series, six inch high. Oh, I left him behind. Anyway, um, we're going to do a collaboration. He's going to do the Scorpion droid, which he's designing at the moment, if you check him out on Instagram or anything. And I think there'll be something on YouTube as well. And then I'm going to do the diorama around it. So another Sandy Tatooine diorama. And then we're going to give it to his 10-year-old son, who is going to love it. It's brilliant. So I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a fun one. Not He's got to finish the droid first, but I've always wanted to get a Mando. So I finally gave in and bought one. Um, Average Joe, what's your favourite cheese? I mean, cheese is okay. I don't rave about it like some people. Ask me what my favourite chocolate is and you'll get a much longer response about sort of Bourneville Dark probably being one of my favourites. Cadbury's definitely. But cheese, you know, whatever's there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not against cheese. I do like cheese. A bit of Stilton, a bit of cheddar, whatever. But, you know, a bit of quince jelly to go with them like that. Um, okay, cheating. Oh, to buying a baseboard timber. You haven't seen my woodwork. More about that in a sec. Ah, Amazed Tay says he's only ever used laser cut baseboards so much easier. Okay, when I started this hobby over 20 years ago, I don't think they'd heard of laser cut baseboards. And let's just say, I can measure as much as I like, but I cannot saw a straight line. I'm not that great. I got rid of my jigsaw because I'm not that good with it. And I have a granite worktop that I work on and I didn't want to be using power tools on that. And when I got rid of the, the, the small bit of garage that was my rough woodwork area left and made it into a 3D print room, the power tools went. So I, I've got a couple of mouse sanders, a bigger one, and then I bought a smaller one and that's it. Um, I, I hate using my Dremel. The last time I used my Dremel, I was trying to route something on a bit of acrylic and the routing bit came out of the chuck and made a hole in my granite only a small scratch i can see it you'd struggle to see it there's a little pics anyway but not in not yeah not happy not happy at all about that <laughs> um david orff says no reason why a laser cut ball can't be custom actually these are slightly custom because the end boards, which don't make much of a feature this week, but you'll see me building them in a minute. They are 500 long by 400 to do the two fill yards at each end. But the standard one is 400 by 400 and it was hardly any more to move up to the 500. I think they must have done them before. So they had all the plans and everything. But a loco and four wagons, which is what my train is, is just 500. So I couldn't go with 400. It didn't quite fit. Um, but 500 works really well. So yeah, and I got them from Grange and Hodder, but more about that in a sec. I'm not quite sure what 6123, gently push the like. Okay, yeah. Press the like button, folks. Apparently it helps. <laughs> so Admiral Balzadiel had a 112 scale mango, it turned out to be a kumquat in the end. My friend brewed these little mini, they look like watermelons, but they were like a cucumber and they were about yay big so yeah you can get these little mini um mini fruit things dark chocolate is good for me according to norm and that's good because i eat quite a lot of it in fact chocolate's one of my main weaknesses that with red wine not a fan of lind though and um, lint which david orff says it's it's just a bit too milky mm, yeah i'm fussy hi to um craig in woodruff wisconsin and plus one for Bourneville, yes. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, I live, what, eight, ten miles from Bourneville, so I really do need to like it because I am just south of the home of Bourneville and Cadbury's in general. I don't know if it's made there anymore, but definitely that's where it all came from. And I went to school in Edgbaston, right next to Bourneville, so I spent years of my life trogging over there. <laughs> it's in my name, lol. Timber. You are better at it than me then. Right, Stephen Cameron. Really enjoyed the Beggar's Canyon diorama. Britain's Beggar's Canyons are the Mac Loop in Wales. 
and most of the Scottish Highlands. Yeah, just not quite as red rock generally in those areas, more granite, but definitely um, that'd be the Mach loop in Wales. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna press play on the movie, which makes me really small, so the lip sync matters less. And it's very exciting. Um, so I'm gonna talk through it. Um, really exciting unboxing video. So Pico did sponsor the track originally. I realized with hindsight, I didn't buy a lot of stuff because it was a handmade track. So I bought really just enough to have the rail that I wanted and to put the track down perhaps on the um, areas between the points, but everything else was hand laid. Uh, sorry, there's two types of track, double O and um, double O nine. And the double O nine is about N scale, but with different tie spacing. So I was going to use the track between the points, but the points were all hand laid. So this is the first time I've opened my box of laser cut baseboards. I was very impressed. Um, they were all really well taped. I don't know who you use, but Grange and Honda did a great job. I, I'm not sponsored. I do recommend them though. And that nest of wires is the control system. So I've got boxes and boxes of stuff at Port Dinorwick that has just been sat around for ages. And I realized I hadn't got enough space. So I was just busy moving it all out to the side. It's just so much stuff. Little boxes of like locos and bits. And I dropped one of the 3D prints and smashed the top off, but thankfully I had three of them. I've lost the bridge print though. I have a beautiful bridge print which I probably won't use because I want to do it as an opening bridge, but I've got to do some pocket planet work for the next two weeks. So it will be a while before I get onto it. But thankfully this is taking longer than I expected. So, hey, um, you know, not bad. So we're going to talk a little bit about baseboards. So if you'd like to pop in the chat what your favorite type of baseboards are and which ones you normally use. I want to see if laser cut is a thing. I know in the UK it will be more of a thing than perhaps in America because American layouts are often really big and it just it must be less cost effective to have this done unless you're doing one of the modular type layouts which they do do. So just let me know what sort of baseboard do you like. I really like foam for its ability to be carved up and down. And I've never had a straight edge at the front of a layout before. Now, that being said, this is a dock. So it's level anyway at the front. And there's no real change in elevation in the section that I'm modeling. There's a little bit of up and down, but there's no real change here. It's mostly about whether the track is buried or not than anything else. So the fact this is straight is bothering me a lot less than perhaps it would have done on a more scenic layout where I might have had to build it up. I've also gone for a canopy one because the ethos of this, I was talking about it last week, the ethos of this is the last day of steam. It's very much about a gray, sort of about to drizzle, dingy looking black and white almost, very desaturated day. So I want to control the lighting. I want it to be very cool lighting. It, this is not a happy day. This is quite a sad day. Don't ask me why I'm doing a sad layout, but it's tones of gray very much. So I went with the canopy one. Um, I'm gonna have an integral backdrop and I bought two additional canopy, sorry, board ends so I can box it in. So it will be effectively a top, a bottom and two sides and a back. That's the theory. So let's see what people are saying in chat. Um, Tim's almost within smelling distance of Bourneville. Yep, you're the other way though, aren't you? Hi to Waylanders wandering. Good evening. I don't know what's good or bad, Norm, but Tim will know. Uh, I keep, so Stephen says he keeps trying to tell Mary chocolate is one of your five a day. She's having none of it. <laughs> I guess, um, yeah, maybe with a bit less sugar and fat in there. But it is vegetable. David says, um, hi, Kathy. Are they going to be filming another series of the Great Model Road Challenge? No, is the short answer to that. I've not heard anything, I think, after all this time. It may come back. I mean, the Great Pottery Throwdown did, but I sincerely doubt it at this point. Um, it's just such a, oh, I don't know. I've just realised, as I look at this, the giant subscribe button that YouTube puts up, 
is over my face. So I'm just going to move myself to the top <laughs> so that um, at least I haven't got a subscribe button over my face. <laughs> okay, that's fun. Um, I've never noticed that before. So yeah, I'm really sorry. Um, I don't think there will be another series, but never say never. I've not heard anything in three years though now, so perhaps not. Um, all right, let's have a look. Yeah, I just, it was so much fun. I was thinking about it the other day. I would love to um, just them to do it again or something, but nope. Digger would die without chocolate. I know the feeling. I've got some down here. No, oh, no, I've thought about it. Oh, that's bad. That's so bad. Um, so Maze Tays uses laser cut ply. Joe says, anyone doing laser cut baseboards in the US, he needs one for his O14 layout. So if anybody can help Joe with uh, good laser cut baseboards in the US, let me know. Or let him know in the chat, please. Digger says he's used plywood. I've always used plywood before. And actually, I hate screwing into plywood. Um, and I used probably slightly, this is six mil. I think I used a centimeter last time I did them very heavy um, on the ends and then three mil on the sides because I was bending them. And I couldn't screw or nail, I couldn't nail into the three mil. So I ended up using those little chalky blocks, the um, sort of white things you can screw in on the corners and just trying to get them to kind of curve around. It was just a slight wave, but each piece was just slightly canted. And you could either have as a wave or a slight semicircle is the idea. So they were reversible. So each track entered and exited at the same point when you turned it round. That was the theory. It's very neat. I just was doing too much story of my life. I've got about eight projects on the go now, but I was doing too much. So I, um, I dropped the O30 and just sold it all out. And I'm doing the same now with the HO to just try and streamline it back down a bit. Um, yeah, these all went together beautifully, by the way, of these baseboards. I've got a lot of bits left over though. I've got quite a few long, there were some diagonal braces, which they said you needed for the 1200, but not for the 900. But I couldn't quite work out how you were supposed to, or what you were supposed to attach them to. So I didn't do anything with them because this is 900, not 1200. And then there's loads of sort of long bits with holes in. I was thinking, is that for bolting them together somehow? Anyway, and then there's loads of bracing bits for the sides. But I've actually, because I've got the canopy board end that goes on here, it's already braced double and I'm not bolting them together. I did use dowels in about 10 minutes time to align the outsides to the insides but I'm not going to put bolts or anything. It's going to sit on a tabletop that's got to be long enough, probably the floor for most of my photos at this rate. Um, so I could bolt if I wanted. I've still got four bolt holes on each end, so it's not a problem. And I'm sure I could drill them out if I was really stuffed, but um, I, you know, it's, it's not really an issue. But I said woodwork wasn't my thing. I did debate about showing a lot of this because you're probably all going to just go, <gasps> when you see my woodworking skills. I. I gobbed on a lot of wood glue, like huge amounts of wood glue. I don't know how much you're supposed to use, but it was drying, so I put it on quite thick so it didn't dry too much. And then it said you needed to pin it. I had a look around the house. The only pins I had that I could find were three quarter inch veneer pins. So the whole thing, I had to go and find a hammer too, which well, I did have one thankfully. Um, so the whole thing was glued and then pinned with three quarter inch veneer pins. And if that is totally wrong, I'm not changing it now but I'm really bad. You're going into six mil and I use a pliers to hold them because I'm wimpish and I hit my fingers otherwise. Um, and, but I, I missed the six mil plywood so many times. If it was really bad, I, start, I knocked them out at the beginning, um, but by the end I'm just like, it's in there, <laughs> whatever. You know, I've like put a few hundred pins in. I'm still missing by the end. Oh well. <laughs> um, yeah. So where have we got to? So diggers use plywood, norm, no more model railway challenges. You can do one of them. And other people have taken the idea I've seen and do it. I know Walters do their build off and they were trogging it as the first ever one and people were going, well, I think the Brits might argue that they actually did it first on TV, but whatever. It's great to see people taking up some of those challenges. And one of the limitations of the Great Model Challenge was just filming time. It was too short. 
I was all right for the first one because you could bring stuff along. But by the time you were getting to the final, you hadn't had a lot of time to think and people were expected to turn up and produce brilliant concoctions and I really felt for them. It was the third time for some of them back there on the second series and it was just, it was almost too much to, to just be that um, innovative when you only know a week before or even one of them was only like three or four days before that you're going to be in it. So it was quite hard for them. I'm sure the people who took part will say how hard it was. So, uh, it was, so yes, it was fun, says Wayland is wondering. Digger says, I don't think Kathy would have time for another series. I'd make time. You know, it's one of those things. I'm self-employed. I would just make time. That's as simple as it goes. Loads of great shots of my hair here. I did wonder about editing them all out, but it just seemed it would take forever. Um... So, David says, the next light is going to be Alpine Narrow Gauge Rack Rally. Big height difference, but I plan to have the track bed laser cut. I think that's, having seen my skills here with bashing and unbashing, you'll be agreeing with me that laser cutting is definitely the way to go. Um, Timber says, for a home layout, there is nothing wrong with ply on top of a ladder made of par. P-A-R. Um, plywood? I have no idea what par is. Perhaps... Okay. Nope. Timber, sorry. Par. Just tell me in a minute what it is. But for lightness and more complex shapes like the canopy, the laser coat is definitely a good option. I actually, on my upstairs layout, because all my walls were sloping in, I just hung my top fascia, because bear in mind it was double deck, off the ceiling. It was just easier. Um, and I, I, I agree, upstairs, I didn't in any way make it removable. It's just, it was nailed onto the underneath of the purlins, which weren't straight. And then the front was nailed onto that and that was vaguely straight. I said it actually was loads of chipboard screws. Um, so, planed all round, pa. Thank you, Timber, for explaining that. Um, they did a great... Model Railway Challenge in Germany, trying to find it to watch it. And that's interesting, Mark, because I met somebody who was over to see us when we were filming, and he was a German producer, and he was trying to get it off the ground in Germany. But the last time I spoke to the production company, they hadn't managed to get it funded or released or, you know, anything like that. So that's really good news that they did. Um, I know we got played, the British one, in Sweden, but I've not heard of it going to any other um, countries, really. A lot of people watched it on YouTube in the US who knew me, but yeah, oh, that's good. Glad it got there. Chat covers me in the app. Right, I'm going to the top left. Okay. At some point, shall I go to the bottom left and move my logo? Uh, it's just, I think more happens in the top left of a video than in the bottom left of a video. But I might, I reserve the right to move myself up if something exciting is happening at the bottom and I'm covering it up. There we go. It's nothing like moving around stuff, is there? It's always fun. I can actually see myself now because before I was before the mic, behind the microphone. So there we go. Yeah, but it was good. Always pilot drill before screwing into ply. Yeah, I always, um, I may not be much of a woodworker, but I always had a drill with a countersink and did that on it. Um, cannot recommend Tim's baseboards. Good choice. Okay. Um, oh, recommend enough. That makes more sense, I was going to say. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's good. Everyone has heard of Karl Marx, less well known as his sister Anya Marx. She invented the starting pistol. Mm, okay, Stephen's rocking it up there in the chat with his jokes. Dad jokes, yeah, I think Norm nailed that one. A rubber mallet would have helped. Oh, I just whacked it with my hand. Ah, it was fine. I'm tough. Yeah, the holes underneath are ideal for running the wires through, and that is really good. Interestingly, I'm not running wires between the two boards. I'm doing the magnet thing. And I've 3D printed the pieces. I just didn't get to it in this video. So you'll see that in the next video. So I won't say too much about it, but it should work. If it doesn't work, those really small holes that I've got left are gonna go down from eight on the end. They went down to four because I doweled the um, canopy boards on um, to hold them in place, which with hindsight, I probably didn't need to do. But whilst they were gluing, I 
yeah, anyway, whatever. Um, Amaze Tay says, G-camps of various lengths can always hold the boards until the glue bites Kathy. I, I pinned it because I wasn't entirely convinced glue was enough and they say to pin it. So what's your views? Pinning necessary evil? I mean, I pinned every piece and it does help whack it down because I'm not a woodworker and I don't want to buy the length of clamps I need to do a 900 long board. I'm just being cheap. And I spend a lot of money on tools every week, practically. But I had bought two saws for this and spare um, blades. Um, Stephen, I'm like the lightning with a hammer. Never hit the same place twice. <laughs> That's why I use pliers. <laughs> That's definitely why I use pliers. I am really bad at hitting things. Um, looks like fun. I, you know, these, I do love puzzles and this was very easy to put together. They did have instructions. It was hard to get it wrong, to be honest, because all my pieces are different lengths. So it was very hard to get it wrong. Tim says he only ever builds laser cut buildings in about O scale. Based on that, you need some giant clothespins and elastic bands for this. I do have small clamps that are about yay big that I use a lot, the bar clamps, use those a lot. I also have a magnetic jig, which I rarely use, which is like a tray of gold colored magnetic metal with bent sides and then magnets that are like square magnets to put in it to hold everything together. Can't say I particularly use it. It might go at some point because I haven't really used it. But I use an awful lot of engineering squares, one, two, three blocks for getting my corners lined up and then just um, use them to hold it in place while it dries. Um, lol. Wow, no way. That's cool, we the German producer. I'm sure I saw a trailer on Instagram that looks very intense. I can imagine. I mean, Germany is one of the biggest markets. Or it has such a high intensity of modelers there and some really great modelers. So, you know, that would be awesome to see. Um, Ray Linda says, thank you. So Joe says, S for S in US, sanded four sides. Oh, so you sand, we plain. Hmm, interesting. So Thomas says he liked the 3D printed parts I made up for the punk work. Yeah, I, I, I had all sorts of really exciting over the complex top um, 3D printed parts for that. I have done a 3D printed part for the point work this time to hold a micro switch. Um, I, I proofed the points so they're not going to short unless a loco runs and the micro switch hasn't gone. Uh, it's on its third iteration. I keep changing it uh, because I couldn't decide whether I wanted the point rodding to go through to the front. And what's really ironic is I decided to put it through to the front after I'd laid all the track, having thought about it quite a bit. And I could have put the wiring for one of the pieces of track anywhere and I managed to put it in directly in line with the point. So I'm just like, really? Just like even half an inch, but it was all laid by then. <laughs> oh, thanks Norm. I've just seen Norm come up with a, a $9.99. That's brilliant for my tool budget. Thank you. That will cover the um, one of the saws, I think. So that's brilliant. That's really, really good. Thank you. Um, so let's go where we got to. So Digger says pinning has to help. I have a small nail gun for the purpose. I used to have a small nail gun, but it needed a massive compressor. So I, the kind of compressor went years ago and I haven't got the nail gun. I got rid of it. I had like a staple one as well. And I got rid of all that because I wasn't expecting to do woodwork. But to be honest, this size of bench work, I won't do this again now for another two or three years, probably. <laughs> Maybe two years. Yeah, and if you notice, I'm just playing games. If I keep getting my phone out, it's a sad hobby addiction. Um, so, yeah. So, David says he's surprised they don't pre-mark or even cut screw nail points with the laser cut boards. I'm not sure you need to with pins. My pins are so small. There's, they didn't split a single bit of plywood unless I went off the edge, which, you know, they just so, yeah, me checking it's gone through. Probably me pounding that one out as well for, oh no, maybe, yeah, no, I took it back out. Let's have another go. I've actually got podcasts going on in the background and things like that. So sometimes I'm just um, changing the podcast. There we go, try it again. I should have probably drawn a line with a ruler, but there we go. And I finally thought now, oh, I should have drawn a line with a ruler. But these are the two fiddle boards that I talked about. So they're just squares on the side. 
they're going to be open, nothing exciting to them, and taken away when it's stored. I'm thinking I'm probably going to use kitchen cabinetry when I get my new workshop extension, which will be really next year at the earliest, considering I haven't even had the plans off the architect yet. Um, because of that, I'm, I'm hoping I can get a double cabinet without the central bar at the front so I can just slide this in, because they're just about 100, they're just under it probably, wide centimetres, and these is 900, so it should just mill, so this should just slide in. Okay. So Stephen says they look very nice, lightweight baseboards, handy if you're exhibiting. They are really nice and it's got plenty of grab holes at the moment. Um, it actually is standing on my kitchen floor at the moment on its end. It's really useful, it can go on the end. And I'm going to make sure that everything I do is very lightweight on this. So I'm not going to use solid, heavy, anything. I'm still debating what I'm actually going to use for the, um, just the sort of, cruddy slate area but yeah I, I don't think it's going to need too much filling I, I need to bury the ties so it's quite a bit so I'll probably fill it up with something I don't necessarily want to use card because it can warp a bit so I'm still thinking about that but I probably won't do daz or anything like that except where there's cobbles because there is a cobble area in the main track um so Timber says, the magnetic tray is cadmium plated, probably made by Micromark, great for scratch building buildings. Yes, I'm not going to click on the link right now, but it probably was a Micromark thing. I may even have bought it in the States or in the UK when Micromark shipping wasn't so exorbitant to get over here. Um, hi Lee, who's arrived? Hi Phil, who's had his message deleted. Whatever you said. Um... David, sorry, I was thinking that marking the location would make it less likely the pins nails would go outside of the six mil. No, no. I mean, I can hammer straight, perhaps. But I think some of it, I mean, it was in the middle. Then I just went wonky. So it's not about where it starts. It's about where it finishes quite often with me. Definitely didn't always finish perpendicular to the top. Uh, yes. Thomas says if he was to redo layout, he would definitely consider... Out outing the controls to the point work at the front where a show can still talk to the audience and have control. Yes. My problem was, and this is still something I haven't decided, I was going to do a dock front on the front, just like a sheet of brick on it and a dock edge right on the front, just like I did on my last one. The trouble is it doesn't quite go far enough to the edge, but if I want to put the bridge on, I have to jut it out a bit. I'm debating at the moment whether to have um, a jut out for the bridge that magnets on the front. I'm debating that. I'm still not 100% there. And also, the one thing I don't like about laser cut baseboards is there's no smooth um, front because there's all of the little tabs sticking out. But all of the materials I have that are easy to cut to create a sort of curved corner on it all of those are how can i put this they're too soft probably they would scuff over time if it's going to be exhibited or knocked around so i'm still undecided i was debating and then i cut one of the tracks and i realized that five mil six mil was now not an option because i cut it a bit short um but i was thinking maybe a three mil fascia with something and i don't like um the pattern on plywood necessarily. This is very smooth though, it's, it's a nice ply, very nice ply. It's actually some of the, much nicer than B&Q ply. Um, so what I was thinking was perhaps I would um, use three mil uh, PVC board. It's, it's not quite robust enough, but I need to decide before I do any scenery because it needs to be glued on. And then that would just, I'd need it in two pieces because I haven't got a piece that's long enough um, to go across. So then it's like, oh, do I fill it? Do I paint it? I would just have gone with the black, slightly shiny surface otherwise. So I'm still debating. I might just buy a bigger piece of it because I think you can get bigger than, I think I've got A3 at the moment, but I think they do it in other sizes. It just gets a bit pricey for delivery. So I might just have a look at doing that. But other, I'm still undecided about that front fascia, which is obviously an integral part. I could paint this black and see what I think. Anyway. Yeah, I might do it and see if I can fill it to look reasonable. We'll see. Maybe a good spray of motive putty. I'll put it on everything else. All right, what else is in chat? 
Um, so Jewel says, what am I building now? I'm playing a video game whilst listening and obviously missed the reason. So there are three pieces to my baseboards. This, this is a bit of arty videoing for um, YouTube. This is what they'll get. Yay. Um, this is a side piece. It's a fiddle yard. So it's going to have the tracks. It's going to be scenic in the middle on this section, the canopied section. And they're just open fiddle yards. They're going to have the track as it runs out onto them. It's just going to sit there. Um, I can move the loads in and out so I can have full and empty loads. Um, I'm not really going to switch it much. There is a point on the front, but I haven't worked out yet how I'm going to do the couplings. I found I've got some wheels. I think they're Alan Gibson wheels. So, and I've got the, um, but I haven't tested this yet because I haven't got around to having a working double O. I have actually got an N gauge wagon I found when I was clearing out my stock. Maybe I'll go and run that on it as well because it should work. It's a below nine N of the same distance. So yeah, so I might, um, I need to do some test running on it before I finish. But hey, it's all laid, just not test run particularly. Um, so where have I got to? Um, so Phil Wright, oh yeah, sarcasm often doesn't come across well. Don't worry about it. Um, DCC concepts have a radio link system right now, means you can have controls for points on a battery powered remote panel position anywhere. I've always just had my points on my handset um, for my last two or three layouts. So I have NCE, it has a power cab and it has a pro cab and the pro cab was on the main layout, but I've got one handset that can also act as a thing on its own. And all I have to do is plug it into a universal um, plate, which will have to go on here somewhere. And that it goes onto that universal plate and it's on a wire because the wireless system for NCE is illegal in the UK on the bandwidths. But I just threw my points off that. I had an accessory decoder and just threw them. And so I didn't have anything on my fascia. I just had a plan of where my points were and people had to throw them. And I had macros for my main line, which would just line eight switches to, to the right length, uh, to the right settings to put the main line through. So I am not a fan of fussy fascias. Fussy fascias do me in. I love just a plain black, simple fascia. So if there's points on the front of here, and this was my debate, because I love a plain black fascia. It's just, it's like theater wings, just plain. Um, and that's just what I like. I'm not saying other people's fussy faces are wrong. I'm just saying my personal preference set by the people who inspired me when I was younger in the modeling hobby of railways all did, you know, plain black faces. So what I was thinking was I might just have a black knob on the front, a small black 3D printed, obviously, knob. We'll see. It's piano wire going back and forth and then a vertical bit soldered on, hopefully. Um, Formica laminate. Now that's interesting. How do you cut formica laminate? What do you use to cut it? Bear in mind I don't have a jigsaw, I'm going to be using a, either a normal saw. No, I have saws, hand saws. Actually, I had three or four and I put them on one side to not go out in the garage sale on my front drive when I got rid of all my stuff and I can't find them so I'm <laughs> thinking that I, I missed and they went out. So I don't actually have a saw anymore, a big saw. But yeah, um, a um, you know, just a small saw. I will see builders with loads of jigsaws and stuff. Um, mega points are also bringing out a Wi-Fi system that control points remotely. It's all very interesting. Um, I just did mine off the DCC. I know there's problems with that, but the main problem with it that I would find is if someone shorts your point, and my dad was always running onto points the wrong way, it just was a habit of his. You couldn't then throw your points if they were on the same system because your DCC was shorting. So I had my layout blocks. I had four block control system and one block was specifically to points. So if the points, if, if a loco fouled the points because it, they weren't set correctly, it didn't matter because I could still throw that point the correct way because it was on a separate block. So that's the only problem I had, but I've always done it on DCC system. And I understand on big layouts that overloads the DCC system. But I think for me in the future, I've got all of that kit to do it. It's just on this, I was going as simple as possible. And it's two points and one of them's rarely gonna throw. It didn't seem worth all the hassle of wiring it all in 
and use an accessory decoder. I mean, I have them all, they're coming off the layout upstairs. But when I decided to do this, I wasn't taking the layout upstairs off. And I thought, I have never actually done hand control points ever. I've always done them off the DCC system and with tortoise motors, which I have a kit, you know, I mean, I had 35 points on my last layout, so I'm going to have a lot of tortoise motors left over. Um, so yeah, they will eventually go onto all of these things, I guess. But for this, I was just keen to do something I hadn't done before, so I'm doing point modding. But I mean, tortoise motors, though, the micro switches for you and everything, just so much easier. I was like, oh, this whole having to work out how to throw a micro switch with a rod, hmm, technical. Um, didn't I have a facial piece to overlap the front, like your idea of magnets? Uh, Thomas, no, I didn't um, on this one. I'm sure if I'd wanted, I probably could have ordered one, they would have done it. But the reason they don't is everything is tabbed for robustness. And I suspect they're worried. And also, it's only got a top and a bottom. I've chosen to put sides on, but it wouldn't be normal. People would make maybe five, you know, two or three of these next to each other for longer layouts. So I didn't. I think with hindsight, I could have asked them to, to do that and it would have been a good idea. But I didn't think of it. I'll do that for the next one. I will say to them, I want a cutout. Because I want to put a little return on the side just to hide the exits off to the wings as much as possible. Not a big one, maybe two and a half inches. We'll see. Um, Oak veneer, hmm, I think that may be a little bit, um, I, yeah, maybe a little bit thin to go on this, but yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to have a bit of a think. DCC will also do it through a phone app, that's true, yeah, um, if you've got your DCC system onto your phone, um, and you put an accessory decoder on, it's just like, it's really simple to do. Um, try a stip of... A strip of Velcro for attaching the curtain on the front when exhibiting, very convenient. Yeah, I, I learned so much from Nigel Bowyer, who did some beautiful layouts, and I helped him exhibit a couple. And he was, and Lee Clark was another big inspiration of mine. He did um, Genesis Lumber Company back in the day, if you're really, um, before my time, Oasis Camp he did recently, but um, he isn't even modeling anymore. But he's one of my great inspirations, and he would, you know, he would take a pot of paint with him to touch up any knocks on his layout and he would iron that curtain to death before it went up. Um, Nigel was saying they would always iron their curtains, they were really, and they were normally black. I do have some black curtain material I bought. I'm not really planning on exhibiting this and if I do I'm going to ask for a table and it's just going to go on a table. I'm not going to build legs that I've then got to store. I got that idea from B.A. Bodil when I went there. He says oh, I just asked for a table and punk it on that and yes it's low um, so it's frowned upon for its low height. So he had his on some kind of stilts. I've actually got a set of um, trestles that I could put it on here um, without the fiddle yard on, obviously. But if I get the new workshop and there's kitchen cabinets, it's actually going to go away most of the time in the kitchen cabinets because they're the right width, so it doesn't get dusty. Um, though it has got a lid, I suppose. Or it's just going to go on the worktop that's going to go on top of that on display. So... I'm, I'm nowhere in this house where I need to do legs. So I've not really thought too much about it. But yeah, Velcro and curtains, is, it's, you know, cotton, black cotton material or something. It's just so classy, isn't it? It does look good. It does look really good. I had that on my first layout. Um, but because it was in my lounge, I didn't do black. I actually did some old beige curtains because the lounge was kind of magnolia. Um, so they didn't look quite so dark. Um... Right, I need to catch up. Where have I got to? So, Amazed Taze said, um, my boards came with a separate fascia board overlay that can be glued up the front. Once it's painted, it tidies it all up. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I think it's because their canopy board isn't their normal one. that People normally have open ones. So, where did you get yours from, Amazed Taze? Tim Horn seems to have almost disappeared off the face of the planet, which is, he he's a perfect, and I had spoken to him before about doing it with the canopy just jutting out slightly further in front so the light doesn't not strike the first few inches of the layout, which can be a problem when your face is directly above the layout below. You can end up with kind of an, almost a dark line at the bottom if you're not careful. 
um, with lighting. So yeah, it, it's something with hindsight, but I mean, I've got a sheet of three mil uh, PVC on the side, so it, it, I can definitely do it. It would have been better with a tidy front though. So, Andrew Estep says, my club does this when we hold an open house, also the clear plexiglass can go in. I wondered about putting clear plexiglass on. I'd get that just cut though. I would just get it cut. Um, the reason for doing that is obviously protection from dust and things like that. I know um, Lee's first layout, which I never actually saw in its entirety, but I saw pieces of it. He put glass on his. It was a big thing, you know, it made it look like a TV almost. Right. So where have I got to? Is this commission work, Strowman? No, it's for me. I originally wanted to do a railway because I hadn't done any for a long time and I was stalled on my New Haven. Then I stalled on this, so it's just been sat on the side for a long time. Um, David says, for my king, we get with a sharp knife, it's very thin. That's good to know. I kind of, I know what it looks like. I've just never worked with it. And then Andrew says, a small laminate router cuts lamp for me. <laughs> okay, well, you heard my problems with the last time I tried routing, so I'm going to wait until it's not on a granite work surface for that one. Um, it needs to be scribed neatly all the way through then snapped off. My problem is I want to do a curve on the corners and I'm just wondering how I would cut that. A router is a better bet for that, but I'm not very straight with the router. Um, Joe says, am I using Pico Crazy or the mainline 009? I use Crazy Track. I think it's Crazy Track, but I don't think it makes any difference because the whole thing is going to be more or less buried. So I pick Crazy Track because it's, it's hardly visible. The main line is Bullheads, code 75, um, because, hey, that's what would be there, and it was new. Um, so at the moment, I'm putting the end boards on, and these end boards are so that I can cove the back, because I do like, it's only a small cove, it's a 52 mil diameter cove, which happens to match exactly the cove at the top that is in the canopy. There's actually a small coving on the canopy. So I've 3D printed yesterday more a 3D print coving to sort of go across the top and down, which I think will just help neaten it up because I'm debating lining the back with, talking about the same problem, it's got tabs in it, lining the back with just paper. I've done this before. Buy the thick lining paper you use for your walls and just wallpaper it on. I mean, I paint the wood first and then just wallpaper it on and round. And then I'll put the fascia on after that because it will then hide any, you know, it'll be easier to paper into that. And I can't cove at the front, which I did in the last version because um, uh, it, the track's too close to the edge. It's a slightly narrow this by a few hundred mil. Um, so at this point here, I'm cutting out the holes for the trains to exit to the fiddle yards. Now, I measured them this day, then the saw delivered, and I was able to cut them. So that was good. I literally just got um, trains and measured the width and height and used that. I, I want it to be as narrow as possible. They're all exactly square on because I've learned that you don't cut track on curves if you can possibly avoid it. You can do it, I have done it, but it's better to do it on a straight. And because these are sliding on and off and everything, the fill yards, I decided square one was best. So they're all exactly square on as they exit, hopefully. I mean, they're measured to be square, whether they are or not, we'll see. Um, okay, so, Amaze Tay says a razor saw work, but you need to use masking tape, otherwise it'll spin into the Formica. I've got one of those um, Tamiya scribers, which could be useful. Yeah. Phil says, I still haven't worked out what cuts on the 009 point we were talking about on Facebook. We'll get there in a minute, Phil. Don't worry, don't worry. I, I, there's a loads of footage of me going, this is a point. This is his big brother point in, that I'm used to. They're so wee and diddy, as I called them. They're just absolutely titchy, these points. I, I mean, sneeze and you lose one of the joiners. I did, I found it on the floor um, a few days later. Um, so Joe says, bendable Luan Ply makes great facing. I can imagine, I, um, I've seen some really good 
Bendy MDF or Bendy ply used um, for coving and things. Um, so Tim has a pair of camping tables which he uses layout supports. I think it's a good idea, you know, something like that. Most shows will have, um, most shows you go to will have tables for you to have. And someone suggested you put a table on table. And most of those are six foot and six foot is two meters. And this is 1.9 meters. So yeah, it should fit should fit on one. Um, so Norm asked, what am I showing you in the video? I think I just explained that. I just cut, I'm just spending a lot of time measuring, ready to cut the holes. Um, I've got my square, engineering square, to make sure everything's vertical. Now, I'd never used a fret saw before. Whoa, trying to get a fret saw in here. And look, I'm really good. I do drill corners, um, different size corners, because I want the bottoms to be quite sharp and the top a little bit more rounded. But whoa, fret saws. You really have to tension it and then, um, you know, just, yeah. It took me a while, the first one, which is the one on the video, I was very wonky. I think actually I didn't make it to the video because it was so wonky. I got better by the second one, by the last hole. I was cutting that fret saw like I've been doing it my whole life. But, you know, some people did woodwork at school. I went to a girls' school. We did home ec and dressmaking. Um, I have made dresses since then, so it wasn't all unuseful, but it, it certainly wasn't as useful as woodworking would have been at this point. Um, digger, it's a switch, Norman. <laughs> Tim Horn, amazed taste says. So Tim Horn does really nice baseboards, but his when I looked when I was ordering just before, when I was just before Christmas ordering this, his um, his website was down and they said he had a massive backlog. And I wanted this in January, February time. I ended up doing it in March, I know. Um, but I was planning to be a month earlier than I actually was. So I didn't really want to wait. Um, for, but I had been in touch with him in the past and he's been very helpful. So Tim Horn's a good one. Um, oh, I'll come back about the, um, the points in a minute. I, I sort of waved it a couple of times, Norm. But there's a whole piece on it when I'm wiring it up. So don't worry. I will talk about the points in a sec. Um. <laughs> so for those who don't get, Americans call them turnouts and they switch. We call them points on this side of the Atlantic and we shunt. But I will use both because I have modeled more American than British. For this, I'm using points a lot because they, it's a British railway. But I would have called them turnouts for the first 18 years of my ever doing model railroads model railways really so turnouts makes more sense to me and switches but switches is confusing because i actually have micro switches on this as well um, but the americans cope they they all seem to know what they're talking about and they never had any problem understanding me um someone else who's uh stephen says he just sits his layouts on a table when exhibiting it is better for kids and wheelchair users i know that i love a tall layout i really do but when mine was up the loft Kids and wheelchair, I mean, kids could hardly get up there unless they were tall enough. And wheelchair users were never getting up my wooden loft ladder. Right, this is for Norm. I'm going to talk a little bit about the turnouts. So the, the inside two are insulating and the whole of this is live from those two points, sort of um, two middle toe end, they call that. The two middle rails at the top left, those two I'm handily pointing at. That whole lot is live down the middle. Um, and I didn't have, because my last one didn't have frogs, I didn't actually have any um, insulating joiners. And you need to insulate them because they will end up at some point the wrong polarity for the next bit of track, as I'm sure you all know. I found these. I think there might be microengineering like bridge track or something because that's the only other track I've got. I have no idea what they are or where they came from, but they were the only insulating ones I had. They're probably made for HO. They're a little bit loose, but hey. You must make do and mend. It does mean they don't actually slide into the little hole that Pico gives you because the Pico ones are clear and slightly thinner, like quite a lot thinner. Um, so yeah, but I found them. I was very pleased because otherwise you wouldn't even have got this far on the layout because I've been waiting for someone to deliver insulating code double O N joiners. And I hadn't ordered them. I've got four packets of normal ones, but none of this one. Why? I wasn't planning on doing points that needed them. So there we go. Um, 
So Mays Taze has 15 of Tim Horn's boards. No wonder he hasn't got any time for anybody else. Oof, you've got them all. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it will, Timber. So Timber says he imagines the micro switch will be added later to the hand point rod to switch the frog polarity. It is. I've put the wire in at the moment, the green wire. I haven't put in the, um, I haven't wired anything up or, or checked any of the wiring yet. That was, I didn't get that far. Um, but So here we go. On the left is my normal points. I've laid 30 plus of these. On the right are these ones. Look how small they are. But if you look, that point's got a hole in it, in the track, it's a very technical term. It's got a cutout. There's no cutout on these little ones. Um, and on every single one of my, and they're both electro frog, I have gone through, snipped the back, and um, there's no frog wire on these little ones either. Because um, these are the smallest points they do. And there's none of this crossing. So there's no cut rail. This is what I was talking about, Phil. And there's no wiring your point to the side. So is that an issue? I think it could be, because in DCC, your track is always live. And if you throw your point and your micro switch for some reason doesn't throw across, you're basically shorting your whole layout when you throw your point. Oh, and I've left the switch, the, um, on my HO1s, always took all the points, um, springs out because they were thrown on tortoises and they're stall motors and you don't need the spring. On this one, I've left the spring in so it's got a nice solid click for um, coming across. So on this, I'm going to do a micro switch when the rod hits it. The vertical bit that goes up will also go down and, and move the micro switch across. But if I get that wrong, if something comes undone, there's a real danger that my um, point could just short out. Normally, it will only short when you run a train onto it incorrectly. So if you wire it up like I was showing my double O H O style ones, then you get that. And on that particular points instructions, it told you to do that, to wire them for DCC. So I've done that on every single one of my points. And I wasn't sure, and I chatted to Tim Williams and he said, it's a debate on the forums whether you do this or not. But a lot of people do DC and I'm doing DCC. So in the end, I just decided I was gonna cut it to be sure. Because I know that works and I've wired 40 points probably in my life, probably more than that, with those cuts in. So there we go. Yeah, almost straight on that cutting. Um, hi, Vez. Don't worry, you're here. That's what counts. He was worried about being late. <laughs> PRC789 says, I'm building an N-gauge dock and I've lost no end of royal joiners. What surprised me more was I actually found it on the floor later. So here we go. These are my little little ones. I'm just um, making sure they're flush on the bottom because I think they're slightly tilted, if anything. But, you know, there they are. So David says, with lighting over the baseboard, you need far more height than just sitting on a table unless you want everyone to crouch down for viewing. Um, bear in mind, it's mostly going to be at home. I'm not planning to take it to any big exhibitions. BA Bodil put boxes that it sat on, on top of theirs. So I might just turn boxes upside down and put it on there. Um, that's just, you know, a thought. Um, the, yeah, it is an issue. It, on mine, it's going to be sat on kitchen height worktops. So that, I think that, yes, people will need to bend down to look at it, but it won't be that bad. Um, <laughs> Mace Taze is number five. So you are going to have a big layout if you have 19, 20 of his boards. Normally they are teeny, yeah. I can't believe it. I mean, 009, just how small the wheels are. Just everything is small. And I know it's it's still 00 scale. And you can see why. They just pushed most of this. All these, um, the siding that I've got on the front that you'll see as I'm laying it, now it's hand pushed. I don't think the loco ever went down there particularly. I think it would just drop them off and the men would push it down to the front. Um, so Phil's got it, that's good, yeah. Um, so it was just about a debate on whether you cut them or not. And some people do and some people don't. And just because I'm all, you know, I've, I've done it so many times and I've, I've got that method as knowing it works. What it means is the point blade, wherever it's thrown and whatever happens with the micro switch is always in the polarity of the rail next to it because it's wired to it. And only the frog changes. So that's the theory. 
Tim Williams, I managed to 3D print insulating rail joints for HO after losing the pack I'd bought. Ah, oh, I didn't even think of that. Oh, I'm a big 3D print person. Why didn't I even think of that? And they're out of stock everywhere. The points were a bit hit and miss, but, but I got enough that worked. Yeah, sorry, really the prints. Uh, yeah, i would be fine. The problem I imagine mostly is that it just fuses if you don't leave enough gap. Phil, I won't need to make the cuts as I'll be using a toggle switch with several terminals that will activate my point servos and switch the polarity. If I was using my um, uh, turn tortoise motors and I know they work really well, then I probably wouldn't have bothered. Quickly back to the video. I have always, I did my first UK layout and I laid the, and I wasn't really in a club and I was new to this. I laid a lovely sweeping curve across some baseball joints and then cut it with a Dremel. Vroom, bling, it all went straight. Popped out the plastic of the um, flex track, just not enough oomph in that plastic to hold that curve. So now I always, always use copper clad PC board it is effectively and I cut it to length. You can buy it, um, I always use this one. I've got it in O and I've got it in, because I had it for in 30 where I hand laid the track. And I've got it in um, this, which is more of a double O HO size. Uh, I've got packs of it, I just sat around and I cut it to length with a razor saw and then just cut the top down. So there's a gap electrically. And what that does is just allow me to solder the ends because it's very important to me those ends don't move. They're easy to knock, especially if I'm using a, um, a fiddle yard next to it and I need them to work. So basically every single joint on my um, board will always have copper clad at the end. The other thing is I also um, wire every single piece of track that I lay. Bad habit or not, I wire every single one. I forgot to wire the points though. I was having a bit of a derbrain moment and I got to the end, I laid everything and I was like, well, I'd laid the front line, I hadn't done the back line. I was like, ah, oh, I have not wired the points in. So, you know, I wire every bit. It was easy enough to do because I had soldered those extra bits of wire, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, I told her the extra wire, so I actually just popped a bit to the side and soldered onto that. It was very easy. Then I just got to bury it in a bit of crud. Um, Norm says nice cutout. Thank you. They're, I hope, I mean, I think they're actually slightly bigger than they need to be. Um, I can always cut them a bit bigger if, if needed. Now I've worked out how to fret saw. Um, I can do it again. But I was, um, th there's clearance. The only thing that worried me is afterwards I thought, did I allow enough for the track? I think I allowed a few mil. So let's just hope. Um, and I just, I ran out of time once I'd laid all this. And then I was like, oh, I should have checked. Um, Nice cut out. Hi everyone. Hi Faults Bailey Model Railroad. Hi Rick. Right. Um, right. Right. So, Bernard says, "Well, I'm really tardy, Kathy. I just jumped out to the corner to say hi and what a stellar model you are. Thank you, Bernard. Always nice to be told I'm Stella." <laughs> um, Tim says, "Many of the signs would be laid with bar rail and suitable for locos. Yeah." Usually hand shunted, there may also have been cable shunted siding that was parallel to the local work tracks. Certainly in the main quarry, the and I would like to do a quarry scene eventually. Tim has done a lovely incline or has a lovely incline that he he acquired, um, and done a great. Um, he was at a show uh, the last Wally I went to with it, and um, or was it the one before? Anyway, um, I'd like to do more of the bits of the siding of. Dinorwick and I also have a uh, O gauge, narrow gauge obviously, O brass loco kit to do of one of their quarry hunslets. And Tim sent me an email showing the new Batman one, so Batman are bringing out a quarry hunslet. So we expect to see a lot more of those slate quarry layouts coming out as everyone buys the hunslet. I've got one on order. I, I caved and bought one even though I'm trying not to buy anything new. Um, and I should just say I super glued those copper sleepers at the end. I just super glued them. They will be well and truly in place by the time all of the, it's not ballast here, but all that's in the way. Now, this is my method for laying point wiring and it can lead to a few problems. Um, and it's because the holes are so exact. I probably, with hindsight, next time, I've done it both ways. Um, so, 
Stop blathering, Kathleen. Tell them what you're talking about. So I drill up the holes. I mark them on the rail. I solder underneath. So there's nothing visible from the side except on the points. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just solder from underneath, put it all together. Job done. But when you put them on, sometimes they just pull slightly because I bend this and I don't necessarily put it down to the right mill of where it has to go. And on most track, it's not really an issue because you want a little bit of expansion joint if you're in a loft with the temperatures that I have. So a couple of mil out on the joints never really bothered me. But, um, but you, you, your wiring never shows. In this instance, it, I actually had to widen a couple of the holes towards the end to just enable this bit of track to go back down into place because it was so tight because it was such a small, um, yes, yeah, such a small amount of play in it. Um, what you can do and what I did in the other one, which I didn't do here because the access to underneath is much harder because it's on a solid worktop, whereas those are all suspended in midair, so I was always very easy, is I would poke the wire up once it was laid more or less in place and then just dab it in and solder it on from underneath while it was in the right place. So I'd know it was laid and we when it was at this stage, you know, but lined up and everything so I could still lift it up a bit. It's horses for courses, but anyway, the point is I don't solder it to the side, I solder it underneath. So it's it's hidden effectively. Hi Bernard. So Phil, I've angled joints across boards, but have glued and hand spiked a short section of track at the joints to avoid problems. We'll send pics in Instagram. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, when I did my Owen 30, I still think I put copper, even though I hand laid all the track, I still think I put copper on the last one. Um, maybe I'm just belt and braces having had a couple of things go wrong. Um, PRC7i says, I'm also using small end gauge points and have linked the points and wired the frog to its frog juicer. Yeah, I'm not, I, I am Denard. I couldn't be able to buy the frog juicer was the truth. I'm just, I already had the micro switches from the last layout. I mean, I use micro switches quite a bit in various things. And because I already had them, great video work there, Cathy. Blurry sleeve. Hmm, that's impressive. Um, but you know, because I already had them, I just thought, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy any more. So, Controversial. What do you use to glue your track down? I just dab super glue on. Um, I didn't even weigh this one because it was sitting nice and flat. The, uh, the 009 wasn't sitting quite as flat, whereas it was coming off the points. So I did, um, I did weight that to keep it. It had a bit, a few more stresses on it than this one, to be honest. Um, but I just, I just use super glue. Dabs of super glue. Normally the thicker one than this. Oh, no, that wasn't quite as. Perhaps it's the wires that are springing up there. Um, but yeah, just dab of super glue. It's very brittle glue, so it's easy to pop it off with just a knife underneath. Um, it, the thicker one doesn't go under as much. This one just disappeared. Oh, and here's my new piercing saw that I had to buy just so I could do four cuts in two, four pieces of rail. Yay! It's just like a fret saw though, so I was quite good on this by this point. And I hardly knew it had gone through. I didn't even know it was cutting the metal. It just went. Um, it was really not that expensive and came with 144 spare blades so I can snap a few. Um, yeah, PRC 7i says I wire all track even if two inch sections. I am so the same. I wire everything, really. Um, I didn't actually wire one piece on this, I was remembering, and I might go back and rewire it because I was just, oh, I forgot to wire that. Um, so I've, I've got one piece at the end, which is literally an inch, it's, it's three or four ties. Um, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to wire that. It's right at the end. So I think what I'm gonna do is perhaps just wire on to the copper sleeper um, and just drill down next to it because it, it can get covered in crud there. Um, and there's a, it's attached to a copper sleeper and I just forgot to wire it. So I do wire every bit, except in this place, I forgot three things, two points and a little section. <laughs> Great old age getting to me already so timber has always written a little um model tech make an innovative rail liner in all scale if you don't want to mess about with copper clad board that's interesting i'll have to google that um copper clad board to me is not just aligning the rails it's also um protecting them against being whacked so it's it's partly because these are just going to be on their end and they are sanded flush as you'll see 
Um, but I was, uh, you know, if you catch the end of one of those boards, you can easily rip it, is, is one of the things. Um, hey, Rick. All right. Tim Williams, 2018 and 19. The incline you saw was Pete Wilson's work from Quarrel Kumbach. Restored to me by working, yeah, restored by you to working order. I do, however, have several more that are my own work. Yeah, and, and Tim's a real help with, because he works on the big size ones there. Send me photos of this area, uh, a lot of historic photos. He was great when I was doing research. So thanks, Tim. Um, Steve Cameron, I have thought about the double flanges on the seat wagons. Maybe it's because when they're loaded, they have high center of gravity going around corners. What do you think? I don't know why they did them. As double flange. Tim is the person to ask. He'll probably write it in the chat in a second. But a lot of them did double flanges. And I think it's they were hand pushed. So it may just have given more robustness on some of that. So Bernard says soldering like that sure makes for clean and unseen. Yeah. If you're not quite lining them up well for three pieces of track here, it wasn't a problem. And I this ply is so soft you can just tweak it with an exacto if you do need to move your track a bit, which I did on one or two of the pieces. I um, mean, the holes are still quite small, um, but I, I really am not a fan of my soldering skills and any globbing on this is underneath and hidden. So that's why I do it. Hidden by ballast or hidden by um, crud, in this case, slate. Yeah, Timber says, I hate seeing wire soldered to the side of the rail. Guys, kindred spirits here. If you do it, don't feel bad about it. I did it for, for years. This is kind of, um, I've been doing this 20 years and I may not have laid much track recently but you know I, I just I'm trying to make this one really good there's one bit I really hate in it and there's nothing I could do it's because the distance between the rails is so narrow in the actual um, real thing the point actually comes out further um, than I needed it to and so to keep the line of the point because obviously you want your your track to be square you don't want it to go like this on the joint. Um, I had to come out a bit further than I wanted at that section. I don't think it will show um, particularly, but they are quite close together, the tracks. And they're just like very small locos. Right. So Tim Blue's track with PVA. I'm too, I haven't got the patience for it anymore. Amaze Taze is always PVA. Norm says nice saw. Seven pounds off Amazon, I think it was. But yeah, it was a nice saw. Um, the, uh, it, it was chosen because it came by 1 p.m. the next day and wasn't massively expensive to cut four rails, but it actually did a nice, nice job. Um, Tim says he has used super glue as well, usually for difficult bits where the track won't stay put while the glue sets. I'm just lazy, so if you put it on super glue, you don't have to have so many weights, it's all just glued straight away. So PRC 789's used Depending on where the track is, he's used white glue, super glue, or copy decks. 144, why not just give you 150? Hmm, I don't know. Um, blades. Ah, they're in 12s. They're in packs of 12. That's why. So, Timber says he uses contact adhesive to glue the track. When I was doing uh, point building with fast tracks, he uses plyo bond, which is a contact adhesive, and you can melt it with a soldering iron. So he would, and he's using copper clad sleepers for to make his um, ones that he's soldering to, um, obviously. Uh, every few points in the, um, the, the key ones in his point work. He has wood on some of them, but the key ones are all copper clad for reliability. And what he will do, uh, and actually just to interject, this is for the ones that go under the rail joiners. You need to cut them down a bit because otherwise they'll hink your track up. So I'm just filing those bits out so they can slide under there and then just super gluing them in place. Um, but yeah, he always um, used plier bond because you can move it back and forth by putting a hot soldering iron on it and moving the rail. So I've done them that way when I was, and he'd do that on his track you'd lay his track and then spike it for effect. Yeah, Admiral Bell's the deal, it was 12 by 12. So Bernard says it does have more of a challenge, but it's all in the details, right? Yes. 
um, yeah model tech designed by a fellow youtuber well I'll, I'll google that after this thanks timber and i will work out which one it is tim williams the gauge of the hand worked out was very variable so the dumbbell flanges were less likely to fall off the rails yeah i thought it might be it was really awful track some of it was just it wasn't even rail it was just lengths of metal really was rough So, uh, Heisler says he thought Dinorwick was double flanged because they didn't have an, three axles to go on the transporter wagons. That's interesting. I thought they actually had three axles on the double flanged wheels. Hmm. Fez says, have you seen the great big tiny design challenge? It's mostly dolls, houses, things so far, but it could be good ideas for a diorama. I haven't. Someone who's not a modeler told me they really didn't like it and they didn't think I should watch it. And I just haven't got around to finding it. Um, we were watching uh, The Last Bus instead, which is a children's young adult sci-fi. So that's what we watched recently. Um, but yeah, it's Doll's House is useful um, if you're doing larger scales because it can transfer across you hey kathy do you think you can make a video on how to do the background of pictures you use and tips on photograph it with the diorama so i um i did a video on backdrops already it was a five minute one and photograph it with the diorama so i don't think i'm the best photographer in the world and i tend to just put either one of the blue backgrounds that I had, that's on my Beggar's Canyon, from, um, there's a point to this in a sec, um, behind it if I think it should be blue, and it's just painted blue foam board that's warped slightly, as it does, we talked about it last week, it's banana, so it stands up on its own. I've got a couple of clouds, but I just use the plain blue one normally not to distract, and I put that behind, or I use black or I use white, depending what it is, and that's just paper, just black paper or white paper. And that's all I ever really use for my dioramas. What I'm hoping for, and can I just say how hard these little things are to get on? Oh, they're the hardest ever joiners I've ever had to get on. Oh, they're just so tough. Ah, oh, loads of pliering to try and get them down. I know better than to push with my thumb. I've pushed joiners into my thumb before, and given how small these are, I thought they're going in very easily. Anyway, back to the um, things. But the thing I'm thinking of, well, I bought, I bought a projector to project backdrops. I tried it on the floating Death Star. It didn't work that well because um, I was doing stars and the lighting just, just didn't really work with it. But what I'm hoping to do is to be able to project something behind. And there'll be a video out on that at some point when I finally do it. It's actually something that's in the works, but I haven't got a diorama to use it on at the moment. What I am going to do this week, hopefully, is project rain onto my Jurassic Park using it. You have to put it a long way away though, because it doesn't focus for ages. So I'm going to just project rain onto my Jurassic Park and see if I can make it look like it's raining using that. Um, so that's definitely, definitely a video coming on backdrops again at some point, but it's either black paper, white paper, or blue painted foam board at the moment and that's all I use. Um, if I want to cut it out, I cut it out in Photoshop and drop a backdrop in for photos. But as I'm always doing videos, that doesn't really work. So I might then use it as a panning shot with a kind of digital pan on a very long photo. And I have done that with, say, my speedboat. I just put a sky I got off Pexels or Pixabay or something like that and just drop that in behind. Um, and in Photoshop, it will cut it out so easily with subject masks, you know, just select subject and it cuts it out practically. Now, I used to do it the hand away before and their masking tools have got so much better recently. Um, and that's really it that I do. Um, my one tip is to try not, like my biggest canyon, if you can put your backdrop as far away as possible, then you won't get shadows from your front lights on your work. If you have overhead lights like me, it just is slightly in shadow in places you might want light. So I have front lights as well. It often then will cast a shadow. So that's not ideal. Timber Surf uses copy decks diluted 50-50 to glue the ballast. Supposedly helps reduce noise. Oh, interesting. I'm not doing a huge amount of ballast. I'll have some on the double O, I guess, at one point. But it's mostly grassy as well. 
But I was thinking, normally I'd lay cork, just to be clear. If this was my home layout, it had cork over everything. But I'm hardly running anything on here and I wasn't too worried about the noise. So I haven't really bothered because it's all gonna be um, sort of well in. So we'll see how noisy this is. But I, I always bought cork tiles and just cut to match exactly what I wanted. So Phil is tempted to make the cuts in the points and add the jump to some full belt and braces approach now. <laughs> Do you know, Phil, that's what I went with. I was like, I don't know where this is needed. Some people think it is, some people think it isn't, but hey, I don't want to short my points <laughs> because it's quite a lot of current going down there if you're not careful. Um, so Digger says he pins his track and the ballast glue takes care of the rest. Now, I pinned my first track and I drilled holes in the sleepers and I distorted the track doing it. So I've never pinned since. I suspect you're better at pinning than I am. I can't hit, it doesn't help. So Vez says, um, so this will be the great tiny thing is on more four. Yeah. So Timber says, it, well, he said exactly the same point. Pins can deform track. I can tell you that it, they do deform track when I put them in and carry the rail noise to the baseboard. And they defeat the use of cork, which I didn't put down anyway. Um, PK make rail joiners with dropper wires already soldered in code 100. Absolute godsend for me. Not sure if they do them in other track systems. I don't know, but um, uh, I can see the advantage. Um, I really can. And I, I just had bought the separate joiners. And I, again, PK brought those out after I learnt to track lay. So I don't use them because they weren't there when I started. If I was starting now, I might use them. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Right, now you tell me. So there's Digger, about the rail noise. So Alan, hi Cathy, sorry I just arrived. Don't worry, you're here, that's what counts. Um, PK, sorry I just arrived. Did you come up with a solution to use magnets to snap your boards together? Yes, but I didn't make it into this video because it took me so long to put the baseboards together. Who knew it took two days to just hammer bits of wood together and the track. And I had a day off to go to London with Pocket Planet to look at the pipe work in the wall to see if it would be in the way of the airport. If that doesn't make sense to you, it will when I start doing loads of videos on it. it but I'm building a tourist attraction, which is basically a giant miniature railway or several giant miniature railways in London. I'm the creative director. We just need funding. Once the funding is there, I'll be doing that full time. Plus they want me to do some modeling for them as well. So you'll see that kind of modeling. So that's why I think you'll see more railways, but I might be doing like a working diorama for them or something instead, or some of the retail displays, whatever it is that's needed. So some of that modeling will start appearing on the channel instead of the stuff I've got doing at the moment. That's the one I cut too short and my head's in the way. Whoops, move that up. Yeah, that left hand one, it's too close. I can't get a six mil, ah, oh well, there we go. Snap that back. Um, okay. So yes, the magnets, I, I've got everything, I think it should all work. I've got everything, all the supplies. I made 3D printed pieces. They all fit in beautifully. What I haven't done is put it together and checked it because I haven't laid the track on the side ones. And I'll probably put the magnets in and then lay the track so I know everything's aligning perfectly. Um, so it just needs, it needed more days than I had by the time I'd lost a day. And it takes a while to edit the video up and get it up. And I don't like to leave it till the last day just in case, because um, sometimes it just falls over for no reason. And very rarely actually, Final Cut Pro is very good, um, but sometimes the computer just throws a wobbly. So in this instance, um, I stopped on the Saturday morning to get all the video up and I, I, I had them 3D printed that day, but I had to tweak something because I remembered having printed them that this board is a double width at the bottom. So I needed to go and print it six mil longer. So there's a plastic magnet holder and a steel plate holder. And when they come together, then they should bolt through the middle with M3s, I think they are. Um, and then a terminal block on the back, which will then pass everything through. And I'm hoping that that means that the power will, when it joins up, will just work. Let's see. Um, Amaze Tay says it looks very fiddly. <laughs> I thought that. And of course you put it down, test it, take it apart, put it down. For, and getting those, oh uh, yeah, it took me ages to get them on the first time. Just so hard to get those little things on. 
Um, so Bernard points out to Stephen that you can just pre-solder your joiners, but the store-bought ones are easier and faster, but more pricey. Um, yeah, I would, I'd probably, I, on my curves on my layout, I almost always soldered the um, joints so that I get a nice easy curve. Because on a curve between the ties, um, sleepers, I guess you'd call them here, it would just push out enough, just a little bit, just a slight kink and it would annoy me. So I always soldered straight track and then bent it round on my curves. And these are like 30 inch curves or something. So 26 inch at most, I think. Somewhere around about that 30-ish magic um, inch curve. And, and I always soldered them straight and then bent them. Hyde was right about not having through axles on the wagons that went on the transporters. Difficult to explain why in a few characters and without a diagram pictures. Yeah, I mean, this was a really quirky one, which is actually a pain when you come to do it. So for this, I've simplified out all of those quirkinesses um, to just make it run because I put all the quirky bits in and it wasn't running well. So that's a nice idea. Norm saw a club layout that created a forest fire on their trees with a movie projector, very cool. I'm inspired by Mini World Lyon and Mini World Toulon, who are um, you know, working with us on this uh, tourist attraction. And they project all of their backdrops. Um, they look really impressive. If you Google Mini World Cote d'Azur, I think it is, it's um, really impressive, very impressive. And look, my track was laid. I didn't actually show you all the gluing and everything here and this is just me soldering the ends now I wasn't going to do this I was like this is Saturday morning I just need to pack up and get on with the video and then I remembered I wanted to put it on its side and all of these had rails sticking out and I can't put it on the side so at this point I decided to solder everything up um, and then I dremel it and then sand it, well, file it nice and flush because it's important to get that um, so it can stand. I've put a bit of cloth down so it's standing on the stone floor, it's not going to scratch it. I do think they're all flush, um, but just to be sure. Um, so Timber's seen that in a vid. Um, Mark Rogerson, re-backgrounds. Older theatre techniques offer a lot of smart solutions for lighting backgrounds, like going from night to day, yeah. My original design for Port Dunor was a night to day, but I'm still tempted when I get around to doing the people to copy the video and have it as the, the actual steam train coming in, change the number to it and have um, them all standing there with their cameras, all these men watching it come in and go out. In which case it's a daytime scene, so I don't need to do the night to day transition. But I was definitely trying to work out how to do it on an Arduino and it was, it was an absolute nightmare in some ways. Though actually now, because I wanted to do the pink and red at the end of the days and you know just trying to get all of that and to work out timing i spent a lot of time playing with the arduino idea for it and had a i actually had all of this on an arduino dcc the last one on an arduino dcc system so i could run the servo motors i had it all coded up but not working if that makes sense so i played with the code but i hadn't put it into practice i think is the way to put that and and then i just scrapped it all i'm just going really simple blue wire black red wire and i didn't say I have a black to the back scheme on my upstairs one. The black wire always goes to the back of the layout and I have no reversing loop, so that works fine. So on this one, I did the blue wire because I didn't have a black wire. Um, so it's, and red at the front. So it's blue wire to the back always. And I was chatting to someone about this who lays his own model railroads and he says, oh, I always make sure the right hand rail is red. I'm like, that might be easy to remember, but if I look that way, the right hand rail's on that side. And if I look that way, the right hand rail's on that side. So which way are you looking when your right hand rail's red? And uh, it didn't really answer me. So there we go. Um, yeah, but it's good to have a wiring convention. Um, and to remember that you, when you're soldering them, you're soldering them upside down, so you're gonna flip them over. But it just makes the wiring so much better. And that will be on next week's video because um, this is as far as I got this week um, with everything else in there. Uh, Mark says that can be reproduced fairly well now things of LEDs and modern electronics yet. When we can repurpose so many of these things, like how you made a smoke machine from a vape, yeah. People are so clever with what they've come up with. There's just so much stuff out there now. Um, I should have asked Digger. So, oh, grandkids just pulled up. I'll have to watch the re replay, Kathy. Catch up with you all later. P.S. I'm sure enjoy your work. Thanks, Bernard. Enjoy the grandkids. Um... 
I know what Digger and Timber and Norma are on, but they're having a good time. Um, so, Stephen asked how my mum and sis is. Um, Trishy's in Heartlands again tomorrow to have the cast that's been on for four weeks taken off. She broke her foot falling down the stairs. And so that's this week six. They said it'd be eight to 12 weeks. So they're going to x-ray. I suspect they'll either put a cast back on or she's, she's so over having a cast. She's just hating it. Just the inability to put her, and she keeps putting her foot down when she shouldn't. It doesn't hurt her at all. Um, she has a very high pain threshold. And mum's just as knackered. But a friend of hers said, the thing you need for your knee, which is arthritic, and she turned and twisted and snapped something. So there's something definitely wrong in it. It's hurting a lot. And she had sciatica for all of last year, so she's falling apart, basically. But um, someone said to her, what you need is udder mint. I'm like, udder mint? She's like, like a cow's udder. So we go and look. It is for cows. You buy it in big tubes, udder mint for cows. And it stinks of mint. It is so minty. I mean, it's like all I can smell still is mint. <laughs> I was there earlier when she put it on. It arrived in Amazon today. So anyway, she's put this udder mint on her knee. And she says, oh, it's tingling. So um, uh, just one thing, if you do cut, track with a cutting boat you do need to file it nice and smooth because um i use zero and track cutters for the rest just because they're fine they do a nice neat cut i use mine twice on piano wire without running something it was piano wire but they still cut nicely only use them on track piano wire puts a big notch in the side and i had to um sharpen it back out again um but yeah you want this to be nice and flash and that's it for what i got up to that week not a huge amount, it seems. I've just got tracked down. I haven't even wired it or done the points. And the whole idea was that I was going to wire it and have it all laid and there would be one track episode and that would be it. So I will try and pull a genie out the hat and do more on the track work and probably not put too much more on the video because it's not going to be anything extra from what I've done here. But I will talk, because I've still got to wire, sorry, track up all the fiddle yards. What I will do is talk a bit about the wiring, how I'm going to do that, and also talk quite a bit about um, just the point modding, if it works. We'll see. Right, so thanks, Stephen, for asking. Yeah, um, they're, they're okay. Mum is taking stuff that says on it, can be used when carving, can be used without antibiotics. It's all natural anyway, this adamant. It just makes me laugh. So it says, what does it say? I said, well, mum, it's for cows. It says you can use it two or three times a day and you want five to 10 mil on a quarter of an udder. Okay. <laughs> and it's all right, but don't forget to put any of your mastitis milk in the bowl tank. Just don't forget not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, Norm. He thinks I'm um, handy with my tools. So Timber says black to back makes sense. Amaze Tay says he uses the same convention. So I'm, I'm glad to see I'm not the only one that comes up with these simple things. Um, Tim says he's um, time for head off. Bye, Tim. Thanks for joining. And then Phil, I'm keeping the wires all the same colour. Wire at the back is blue, front is yellow, frogs are green, blue and yellow mixed. Yeah, I've, um, I've always used green for frogs, so I just kept the convention here because then I know what it is. Um, I normally would have used black and red, but for some reason I couldn't find any black wire, but I had a huge amount of blue, so I just thought I'll move to blue. It's in the, my mind, it's more or less the same. Though I do understand that in a normal plug, oh, in a normal plug, blue's neutral, isn't it? And brown's live. Better be, because that's how I wired all my plugs recently. Um, yeah, brown is... Ah, oh, I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Um, David Orth. By the way, great book, Kathy. I've been making models for more than 40 years and I still found things I haven't seen before in your book. Thanks, David. I did try and use a lot of techniques from other people and I tried new things and I went through and I tested everything. It took me a year to write for that reason, but it was really, really good. And I hope it's doing well. I haven't, someone said to me, how are the sales? I'm like, I don't know. I, I get a statement once every six months, so I'll find out in... Uh, maybe I'll get a May statement. I think it... I think I had one at Christmas though, so I'm not expecting to see another one for another few months at least. But, you know, hopefully it's 20% off the last time I looked on Amazon, um, so £16. And it's, you know, people have been very complimentary. It's got good reviews. So that's good. That's really good. So if you haven't seen one, go buy one. Please. Um... Right. Stephen says, I've got arthritis in my knee and Mary's waiting for hip hop. 
try this other mint then. Mum's only tried it on once, so I can't tell you how good it is really, but I'll let you know. Udder mint. Um, thanks, Norm. I am not a bench worker or track layer. I'm not a good carpenter. I can't cut straight. And I am denied about not really showing it because, you know, it's just not my strong point. But actually, it's a... And it's, <laughs> it's interesting. When I come to do the 15-minute YouTube summary of this layout, it'll be, and I put a laser baseboard together, click, done. And that's all I show because for normal YouTube, they're not that interested. And this is a live stream, so for two hours, I've got to talk about four or five, it was about five days worth of modeling. Um, so it's obviously going to go into more detail. And the people that join it, live stream, are interested in that level of detail. But I feel like there's a real disconnect between what YouTube wants, short, snappy, 15 minute videos, and actually what's a tutorial type of video, which is what I always used to do. So I'm doing my next project, which is the OMC Griffin, which I'll talk about in a minute if we get time. Um, and you'll have seen me posting photos over the last couple of days, but basically it's an original mecha contest. It's a Griffin. I'm making my own design, just it's original mech. You just have to make a mech. There's no rules except no more than 15% 3D printing. And um, for that, I'm gonna do in depth. So again, I'm gonna do a week's modeling and then just create a video for it that goes on YouTube and it will be branded in depth so I can get back to a little bit more of a tutorial style because that's actually what I like doing is teaching. So yeah, um, there we go. Herman says, hello there, Kathy. Nice to see you again. Greetings from Chile. Well, greetings to Chile. Nice to have you with us. Brown is live in 230 volts. That's okay. So blue is neutral still, isn't it? I was having a moment there. So if brown is live and blue is neutral, then I've still got that the right way around. I've not put them back to front. Um, Roger Farrier says, his name is Roger. I'm from Brazil. I'm in all of your work and talent. Oh, thank you very much. I, I'm always shocked so I've produced some of the stuff. Do you know, I hate my work. I'm going to be honest. I, I just see the flaws in everything I do. I don't know if it's a curse of being a creator, but I always see how I could do it better next time. But because I'm always trying new things, the next time might be quite a long time away. So I have to remember all of these learning points across the time. But there's very few things that I finish and I look at and go, I really liked that. And, you know, I love the tattooing diorama that I did for The Mandalorian. That actually I do still like. I quite like the Halo one, though there are two or three flaws. But I can just look at dioramas that I finished and either I rushed them and I wasn't happy and I put them out because I needed to get the video out on YouTube and move on. Or I just look at it and think, oh, I could have done better. I don't know. It's quite funny, isn't it? Um, it's just funny where you are. But I don't know. I guess that drive to do better is what drives me to do this. So Phil will be using red and black for the rest of his layouts wiring. So I wanted the track feeds different colour. Oh, that's interesting. So mine are all just red and black, but I do have two, or sometimes red and blue, just depending when I run out of black, I think I went to blue. But I do have, as I said, the points on a different circuit. So all of my track upstairs was laid with solid copper core leftover household wiring and um, terminal blocks slid on. So, and I just wire in three or four things to the terminal blocks. And then the points got their own circuit as well. So they're just separate circuits. Um, Vez doesn't have any model trains to wire up, but he uses more power tools than my home. <laughs> yeah, power tools are dangerous things. I'm certainly not using them on granite, that's for sure. The Dremel's the best thing that I use there. Um, ben, when I stick electrodes on patients to monitor their nerves during spinal surgery, I always use left and right, green and white to make sure I plug the white ones in. Green is active, white is red. It's good to have a little mnemonic. I like that one. Left and right, green and white. So you can do that. The trouble with track work is, I mean, your patients don't change direction when you're looking at them, I guess. But with track, if you look that way and you look that way, the right whale's different. And, I, and we hit this on the Great Model Railway Challenge. It came up. We hit it when we were doing in 30 modules and I did a spec. And you had to specify. And people looked differently. People just read the left and right back to front. It was just so much easier to say the black is at the back than it was to say the left-hand rail when looking at the end of the right-hand board. Oh, it just it got very confusing very quickly. Um, but it's good to know that Ben is monitoring spinal surgery. That sounds far more exciting than I do. I just um, spent the afternoon cutting up bits of plastic. 
great. Um, amazed Taze might just have bought my book. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So Tim says, my older quarry layout came out for the first time in two years, a day, in two, it came out after two years break a few days ago. I immediately started rebuilding bits because I can now do better. That actually is the problem with a big layout is I look at it and I was never going to redo the track work, but I wanted to redo how the scenery was done. And I was too far in to do that. And also I, want to, I always like trying new scenery and you can't just put snow on a July layout. So yeah, it's difficult. Um, red and black for rails, blue and yellow for lighting. That's good. That is good. Um, and Timber just uses it the opposite way round. I, I started with red and black for rails, so that's why I've always done that. Um, and green. Everyone does green for frogs because frogs are green, as Timber says. Um, but it's interesting. People, um, obviously, as long as you've got the same convention, it doesn't matter what it is because... Yes, DC has left and right rails. It is important to have because it is a handed current and like AC that swaps. But as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. And I would just recommend, I didn't do it on this because I've only got like four droppers um, and the fifth lot when I remember to put them in. But, you know, just remember, normally I'd have a, a train running and all that kind of stuff. And I'd wire a section and then run the train and then wire a section, then run the train, and then wire a section. I may not even have fixed the track down before I ran it in case I've got it the wrong way around. Um, on this, you know, because it's underneath, I can just put a soldering iron alongside and then just pull it down through the track and then poke it back up again and put it into the same location. So it's very easy for me to swap the feeders out if I have got them the wrong way around. Um, you know, it just is easy. Um, just get a boxcar wagon, put a red piece of tape on one side, black on the other, roll it around your track. No guessing. <laughs> it's true. So John, sorry, you missed me. I'll have to play this back later. Oh, you've missed all my bench work. and Well, not all my track work, but a lot of the track work. So something, some joy to watch. But I was just going to talk in the last quarter of an hour about what's coming up. So the next one, I will be doing the magnets and I'll be featuring that, joining the, the two section, the three sections. I'll be coving the back and getting the backdrop sorted and getting... I may even paint it black now. It isn't to say I won't go back and pick it up, but then I'm not trying to do messy paint when I'm done finished scenery. And I'll have all of the track work um, sorted and laid. And probably actually I'll paint the side ones before I lay the track on them. So the black just goes underneath and I don't get it all over the rails, which can just get spray painted black later. Um, it won't be a problem. Um, so I might do that because I, I just probably will use a matte black Halfords spray paint on them. So it'll be more about tidying up that, getting it all working, getting the electrics working. It's DC so it's very simple, but I still need to wire in that base plate, decide where that plate is gonna go. It'll probably go on a fill yard rather than on the front of my neat section. But then I think, well, that means I have to have the fill yard on to run anything. So actually it might have to go somewhere. I'll think about it, let's put it that way. But it's very simple to mount. Um, it probably will go on the back and I'll just have to stretch the wire around to the front, perhaps. We'll see. So still thinking about that one. Um, yeah, you know, that's what's coming next. Oh, let's take a look. Oh yeah, and Tim just reminded me that technically DCC has no polarity, just to confuse the issue. But if you put the wrong side rail to the wrong side rail, you will have problems. It's a packeted DC pulse. Huh. Something like that. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, you have to make sure your DCC is working correctly. Um, so Stephen says his dad's first lathe was originally foot powered. Then my mum's washing machine died. So she got a new one. My dad used the old motor to power it. Scary to watch. I bet. I've got a hand powered sewing machine, but... That must have been good. Um, I've got a a big so I'm always I'm always about air quality at the moment. So I bought a um, an air purifier to go down by the resin 3D printers because you know I've been doing a lot of 3D printing and I'm I was sneezing. I had a headache for ages and I'm thinking this is down to the crap that's sitting in the air in my house all the time. And I try and keep the windows open and I try and vent it, but my friends will walk in and go, oh, you can smell the solvents in here. And, you know, if you're working with enamels and stuff, 
So then I bought a second air purifier to sit just behind my workbench. I don't know they do a lot, but psychosomatically it's helping. And then I decided the lacquer will, st will stay. It was a lot better with the air purifier, the smell of lacquer. And I've got it vented outside now. And so I've been adding bits onto my bench vent, which is an expensive vent, but recirculating filters do not capture the um, lacquer fumes that I've been using. And I like spraying lacquers. I know they're not good for you, but I'm so much easier to spray than acrylics for me personally as a decision. So I went up the loft as I'm putting stuff out there and I had this massive fan. I mean, it's, it's this size, it's massive, you know, bolt to the floor, massive thing. And I'm thinking of um, 3D designing and printing a event to go around the top of my existing booth and under the edges at the side. So it will just, uh, especially because it's kind of comes up like this at the side. So it's, it's not a, it's not straight. It's got lights on it. And having this come out um, and sit alongside the booth because it's the only space it will fit because it's next to a sink. So there's not a lot of space. Put it there and then um, have a huge amount of suck rate so that um, I can get um, loads more of that air taken out. And I've also got one of the other vents that was there I, I took off because I had quite a lot of vents up there. I actually have two in the loft. I'll get them to, I'll get them to rescue them for me when the builders are taking stuff out because they're kind of bolted in at the moment and I can't bother to crawl. Or maybe I'll take them out later myself if I get that far and I can stand on the layout again. Um, but I'm basically trying to improve the air quality so that the headache goes and the sort of constant smell in the house. And it's getting better as you get towards summer anyway. And if I open the French doors, then, you know, the room vents fairly quickly in the kitchen. But I don't know, it just sits there, doesn't it? But anyway, I mentioned that only because someone said they'd repurpose their washing machine. I was repurposing my fan. Um, I've pulled, so Nick says, I've pulled wires from old USB charging leads. I have yellow, purples, all colours. I get in a right old mess. I use all those USB charging leads as power supplies for my um, dioramas and stuff. Though actually now I just tend to put a micro USB socket on and just it's less messy. But some of my earlier ones just had USB cables wired into them. You only need to have a couple of the wires out, but they are quite useful. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, Digger says, whoa, Stephen, how many RPM in a washing machine motor? They may have a lot of RPM, but they do go slowly as well, don't they? So um, John asked me about my old layout stock. So I've got most, I've, I've had a bit of a think and I'm getting rid of the steam locos as well because I was keeping them in case I did the roundhouses, but I'm not planning to do those particularly quickly, but I'm keeping the spare tenders because actually most roundhouses, they went in loco first. So that's fine. I may build these kits. They were expensive kits, like hundreds and hundreds of pounds, but I built bits out of them already and some of them on the layout and one got a bit smashed when something fell on it. Uh, it was building fell over onto it. Um, so I can't sell them because they're not complete. So they're all sitting with my other South Rhythm Model Works kits down here, but I'm going to get rid of them. So I'm keeping four really useful boxes of stock in this room and another couple in the other room. And I've probably got an, about 20, re uh, not really useful boxes, 20 of the fold down boxes that are this kind of size. Um, full of stock to go but I haven't found all the boxes I have about 10 items of stock with no boxes and I've got some boxes with no stock I need to go through and just find them all and get one final list and as I'm loading up these boxes I'm going through doing a final check of what's in there and because of that um, I'm not quite there on the list but the list is coming and I'm supposed to be going I I, I, I said to Paul I would take a table at the NMRA in May and I'm going down with my dad and we'll go there but actually if I'm visiting my dad we're going to take mum and my sister to see him and there's three people in the car I'm not going to get much in so I'll probably circulate the list but I'm not looking to do a huge amount of selling I'm just yes I could make more money 
Um, but I'm probably just looking to just clear the space out because they, these boxes are five deep down my hallway at the moment. Uh, it's just it's so much stuff. I need to get rid of it. Um, I really do. So yeah, I would have done it this weekend, but I did this instead. And today I did some OMC and I did my accounts this morning. I still haven't done them yet and it's about month end. So I do need to sort the fat quarter end out. Um, so yes, bye Joe. see you next time. Um, too many RPM for lathe. I thought lathe went quite fast. I'm staying out of that conversation. Uh, I don't have a garden shed, Stephen. I'm a girl with no shed. I don't know if it's a, just, I have a nice garden that I designed that is not, it's only about 50 to 60 foot long and it's all fully designed. I did it, one of the first things I did, I love my garden. There was no place in that design for a shed. I thought about it, it almost went in, but the top of the garden, I lost about six foot to the neighbor's willow tree, which he's since cut back. And I put in a, a double wall with bamboo in. So it doesn't spread because the wall's three foot up. It can't get out. It's, I know it's invasive, but it can't escape out of this system it's in. And it's all beautifully scenic, circular, hard, whatevered. It looks beautiful, it looks really, really nice. People like my garden, no room for a shed. So my messy stuff just doesn't happen. Uh, it's a real pain. Yeah, there we go. Hmm. Um, yeah, Norm says you can create a toxic cocktail very quickly in this hobby if you're not careful. I've been doing this for two years at home now and I'm very aware of the fact that it's not been my healthiest two years. I've had a huge amount of headaches and I don't normally get headaches. I've had nothing but headaches for the first year and I think it's just the amount of solvents. So. I'm really trying to, and it's just, you sit there and use white spirit on something because you're doing enamel weathering, or you use, you spray, fine sprays of isopropyl alcohol, who, yeah. So anyway, I'm definitely trying to turn a new leaf in the last couple of weeks to definitely get um, this better. And every time I buy one of these air purifiers, I bought one for my sister for her room for pollen, it's supposed to be good for that, for her birthday next month. And it was, it's, every time I buy it, it's five pound cheaper. So it'll be dirt it'll be free soon, this air purifier. Um, Ikea format thing with charcoal filter, says Stefan. Yeah, I, I actually, in my kitchen where I model, I have a double cooker hat hood. So I have two extractor fans in there because it's over, a, I, I built in a fake, it's a range cooker. So it's, I mean, it's got models on it, so you can't use it, but it's a range cooker with um, a double cooker hood. And it does shift a lot of air, but not half as good as just opening the doors. I think it's coming through the winter months is the worst time because it's too cold or wet to open them. But I will put that on. Um, but I just find it gets out of this room, these rooms and into the rest of the house and just sits there as well. Because the, the, they may not have had much ventilation in those. Um, just looking at the time, five minutes left. Um, but yeah, it's a good, good shout, cooker hoods. They do work well. Um, might be worth saying them through an auction house. I was, Timber, I don't know how I'm going to sell them, but I might give Anorax a ring. I got rid of my last collection to them. The trouble is it's all the same road and there's huge amounts of them. I think I'm on 500 lines on the spreadsheet and I'm probably getting rid of 60, 70 locos, all New Haven. Um, you know, 30, 40 coaches, all New Haven. The freight stock's more varied, but I'm getting rid of the old ones that are cheaper, like I'm getting rid of all the Athern um, and I'm keeping the KD, which if you model American will make sense. If you don't, it's like I'm getting rid of the old blue box with really thick stirrups and I'm keeping the new fine scale stuff that's been done in more recent years. But I mean, I haven't really bought any freight cars particularly other than NMRA convention cars recently. Um, so they're all quite old, but the, um, you know, yeah, anyway, <laughs> I bought too much. Let's just go there. Um, Sparky says, man, I'm late. Yeah, five minutes to go. I mean, like, hey, and then, hey, <laughs> see you next time, probably. Um, Nick says, but don't worry, it'll be on replay. You can always catch it up. I listen to all my live streams late. Um, Nick says, what, no shed? I've got three of them. Well, you must have a bigger garden or, um, yeah. No, I'm not a shed fan. They're a bit damp and cold and you get wet going out to them. Ooh. 
So, um, Sparky making a splash. He's in the shed busy cleaning. So Stefan definitely recommends that um, IKEA cooker hood. Um, John says, uh, shame you don't have a utility room for air work to vent outside than doing smelly work. Into I do actually have a utility room, which I now have it ducted outside. I, I got the builder next door to drill me a hole through the side um, at the top. And I've got a big tube going out now from my vent. And I'm about to put this extra sucky bit in, which I think will make a huge difference. And it did have an extractor fan in there anyway. And the 3D print room has an extractor fan and there's two in the kitchen. But I still found that it's you're also working over things like you're doing oil paints, whatever it is. Soldering, a lot of those fumes are just going into your face all the time. Super glue. I waved my hand, having super glued, near my face earlier. And this left eye started watering. And I presume there was some super glue fumes or something that just got in my eye. Just makes you realise. Um, oh, the terrain tutor. Love your stuff, Kathy. Oh, thank you. Love yours too. I have your book. It's brilliant. Really, really good. Very inspiring. Yeah, thank you for joining. I know you do live streams on a Sunday night, so I'm never quite sure if we clash, but I'm trying to stick to the second Sunday of the month. Um, <laughs> Tim says no shed, no garden. That is a problem. Um, so, uh, yeah, Train Tutor's Mel, by the way, if you're all wondering. And if you don't look at his stuff, go look at it. He does some great stuff. Um, Stephen says, I need to cull some of my railway stuff. Can't resist the nice stuff it shows. So my problem is I do buy far more projects. I mean, I've got eight on the go at the moment, projects. I counted them up. And some of them are all two or three are near finishing. But I just I keep too many active projects. And I have so many that I've started and not quite finished. So I need to get better, but it's just bandwidth and time. I do this full time and I run out of time. Um, and I still don't make enough money. So uh, yeah, it's very funny. I do enjoy it. It's, um, it's a great hobby. And I'm glad to be doing Model Railways again. So my time is almost up. So I'm going to wind it up. Um, normally says I have both your books. I'm thinking, does that mean mine and Mel's? Or does that mean Mel's done too? I know Norm bought my book because he, he showed me a picture of it and it was like, you've got it before I have. I eventually got nine from Carmack, but because they're in a package, a big box coming from the um, US, they took a little bit longer. And my next door neighbour who took one of the photos, he got a contributor's copy. He got his the day before I got mine. I'm like, I'm the author. Someone sent me one. And actually Pete McGoon had sent me one from the US. So I had got one by a few days earlier because he you know, got his, his, his model shop and then sent it to me, which was really sweet of him, sir. So. Thanks, Pete. Um, so, <laughs> Phil says only eight projects. Those are the ones on the go that are actively on the kitchen floor or on the workbench. So those are the ones in the kitchen. It's not the number of projects that have been started, not by a long way. Um, uh, so, I'll wind it up. John, yes, I do like photos. This is my black, white and red wall. So it's all black, white. Some of it's... Um, this one, mm -hmm. that one is just paper cutting, as is that. I got them in China. Um, that's a picture I took in a Chinese island. You can't really see the rest. There's a lot of trains up there. Oh, Grand Central Station over uh, there. That's Grand Central Station, massive one. So yes, I do like my pictures. Um, but great. Thanks, guys, for joining. Really appreciate it. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments. I do answer all my comments and yeah have a great one and it's been great chatting with you next time we'll go into wiring and and all that exciting stuff and hopefully some of the backdrop and things like that as well depending how far i get but have a great time thank you for joining see you all later Thank you.